Okay. Firebender. Fire? Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. How are y'all doing? Fail. What's up, guys? Shout out to CJ uh, Tenorio. I believe that was it, CJ Tenorio. Yep, for uh, suggesting this video. I love when guys in the uh, comments, uh, whenever you guys uh, suggest something, it helps me find some content that I otherwise would not have seen in my feed or suggested videos. And um, it's a great way to kind of branch out into new um, channels to react to. So thanks a lot. Um, and let's get right into it. Uh, this is, there are 13 parts, I think, but, um, obviously we're not going to do all of them in one. We'll probably do it just one episode, uh, per video. And, uh, but let's get started. I don't know. I mean, I know the basics. I know what the Cuban Missile Crisis is. I know who the major players in it were. It was obviously, um, not the start of the Cold War, but the first, one of the first major tests, maybe the most major test um, in uh, nuclear deterrence. And just, I can't imagine how frightening it would have been, would have been uh, back then when you really didn't know uh, what was going to happen. I know there's another, there's a video about these guys on a Russian submarine where, um, I'm sure this is the case in other, like American submarines too, where nuclear submarines where if you want to launch a missile you need like two or three different uh captains or whatnot uh key holders on the um submarine and like they're all spaced pretty far apart so like you can't really like do it with two people or something like that you know preventative measure from you know one person deciding whether to start a nuclear war and i guess there was this one case where they thought america had launched a nuclear missile and two of the three uh, people or three of what whatever like one person decided not to do the turnkey and so he I, I, I'll look him up after and maybe I'll watch uh, the video and react to it again or see another one where um, he should be one of the most you know uh, praised uh, people in I want to say human history but imagine if he that one person chose to also turn the key I'm talking way too much um, right into the video, not right into the video. Now let's get into the video. USA starts the atomic arms race, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Prelude 1, Time Ghost History. Let's do it. In October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis brings the world one launch code away from full-on nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the United States. This documentary series will cover that crisis one day at a time. But first, we're releasing two preludes to the crisis to set the stage. Here comes part one. Really, really nice. This is Time Ghost, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, he's got I mean, the, I, I, I pause way too much. That's another comment I got. But everything, it, all of his, you know, you know, his dress wear, his coat, and stuff. I'm not sure if this guy is just kind of 50s and like keeps his layout like this or if he kind of incorporates different stuff depending on when, uh, you know, the uh, whatever his video is doing, whatever that time period is. I don't know if he changes it or not, but obviously I'm going to check out more of this. Seems like a really cool channel. Thanks again, uh, CJ, for recommending. Andy Nidell. Never before and never since has that possibility of our world being suddenly destroyed been so close. In the 58 years since it happened, the Cuban Missile Crisis and its aftermath has been analyzed in books, dissertations, fictional films, and documentaries. But as more of the actual source documents have been made public over the past 25 years, the story looks significantly different from both sides' original official versions. To understand the crisis, we first have to look at where the two superpowers stand in 1962. The capitalist and communist systems have been in opposition from the day the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia after the 1917 revolutions. The Soviets see the capitalist system as a scourge of humanity that needs to be eliminated. On the American side, the communist system is seen as a direct threat to the American way of life. We believe in freedom. 
freedom for these people, for ourselves, for everyone. We want freedom, we want... not tyranny. The persecution of communists in the states during the Cold War and McCarthyism are well known. But this started already in the 1920s with the Red Scare, when thousands of American communists were prosecuted and incarcerated and even exiled. It's crazy how fast the attention switches from the Nazis to, to not the Nazis, you know? I, obviously, they're, they're defeated, but it just seems like the new kind of threat of the Russia-America kind of you know, having nukes just complete, like, you know, it's like, it's just, it's past news, the next big thing in the Cold War. It's pretty insane. For their political beliefs. The hatchet was briefly buried when the two became allies against Germany in the Second World yeah. War. But it was dug up as that war ended. And in 1962, it is unclear which ideology will prevail. It is total competition with an antagonist who is putting into it everything within his capability. It is not a conflict between peoples, but between basic values and systems of government. Western world, led by the US, is establishing a system of more or less free trade and alliances based on independence, inclusion, and personal freedoms. The goal is peace and prosperity. I'm John Wayne. Is there any better or equal hope in the world, Lincoln asked? than the ultimate justice of the people. We Americans believe there is not. The stonework of our national life is made of this belief. We believe in many things, but this belief that man is a responsible being bears out our own unique stamp as a nation. As a people, we are active and often noisy. We are industrious oftentimes to the bafflement of ourselves and our friends. The communist world, led by the Soviet Union, though initially in cooperation with China, is developing a system of planned economy and regulated trade that depends on expanding the communist system to client states under Soviet or Chinese control. The goal is peace and prosperity. We must create a whole new generation of mechanics, Stalin said. In 1928, the first of a series of large-scale five-year plans was begun. And by 1940, Russia was far different from the land of the Tsars. As World War II ended, many of the Central and Eastern European countries that had been invaded by Germany and then liberated by the Red Army fell under Soviet control. The Soviets also kept control of East Germany when Germany was split into East and West. But this was only the beginning of Soviet expansion. Under communist doctrine, the Soviet Union theoretically strives for a world without borders, controlled by the dictatorship of the proletariat. To achieve this, it seeds and supports communist revolutions wherever possible. This is a direct threat to the democratic principles of much of the Western world. So the US began a policy of global containment, supporting and financing anti-communist movements in Europe, in former European, African, and Asian colonies, and in Latin America. This is an expansion of the Monroe Doctrine from the 1800s, named after President James Monroe, which says that any European colonialism in the Americas will be actively opposed by the United States. The American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. There are we subjects. could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other manner their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States. The U.S. has started to apply the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine towards the United States. United States. The U.S. has started to apply the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine to the entire world, though its direct application within the Americas will prove critical to the events leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the crisis itself. This web of principles and theories brings the two superpowers into direct conflict all over the world and provides the basis on which the Cold War will be fought. It leads to a long series of proxy wars, covert operations of influence, and the fanning of regional conflicts to further the interests of each side. In early 1948, the first major confrontations arise when the democracy in Czechoslovakia is overthrown in a Soviet-backed communist coup, and the Western allies introduce the new Deutschmark as the currency in Berlin. 
Berlin at the time is divided into four zones of military control between France, Great Britain, and Berlin, the U.S., and the Soviets. But the city is still governed as one unit by local powers, right? The introduction of a new currency is a direct threat to Soviet economic control over the city. Up to then, President Harry Truman and the U.S. had not decided what to do with Berlin. They weren't even sure if they would keep armed forces within the city. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, though, had decided his gang would keep control over all of East Germany, including Berlin, and milk it for as many resources as possible. They had, in fact, managed to turn their zone's population against them by plundering industrial resources, forcibly deporting workers, and even transporting whole factories to Russian territory. France and Great Britain, for their part, are staunchly opposed to a Soviet Berlin and pressure the U.S. to hold out against the Russians and, officially, everyone is striving for a reunited Germany with Berlin as its capital. Did you know you can go to LibertyMutual.com to customize your car insurance so you only pay so for what you need? Really? I did. You're not lucky. I'm going to watch your ass In an way. attempt to stop the Deutschmark, Stalin orders a full blockade of the city so that no food, materials, or supplies can be brought in. Berlin the Allies Berlin. respond by creating an air bridge into the city, flying in enough food and materials to keep the city alive. The Berlin airlift eventually brings in so many supplies that Stalin gives up. And the blockade is practically over by May 1949, though officially it's lifted in September. But both sides move to assert their control over Germany. First, the Federal Republic of Germany is created as a democratic state on May 5, 1949. Then on October 7th, the SED, the East German Communist Party, proclaims the German Democratic Republic, which despite its name, is a satellite state to the Soviet Union. With all of this, the threat that the Soviet Union is to the West is now tangible and immediate. It brings the Western allies closer together and they create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, as a bulwark against Soviet expansion. A similar situation to Germany also exists in Korea. After being liberated from Japan during World War II, Korea has been split into the North under Soviet control and the South under US control, both claiming sovereignty over each other's territory. The attempt to create two independent states fails in 1950 when the North invades the South and the Korean War breaks out. While the Soviets and Chinese back the North, a large part of the rest of the world unites in defense of the South in a combined intervention under the United Nations flag. Ostensibly, the war is between an independent North and a UN-backed South. In reality, China and the Soviet Union give extensive support to the North and 88% of the UN forces for the South are from the United States. The war even actually sees direct battle between Russians and Americans as Soviet airmen fight their US Air Force counterparts in the Korean skies. Three years of bloody war end with a divided Korea along the line of the DMZ, not too different from the straight division along the 38th parallel where they began in 1950. Meanwhile in Europe, the conflict around West and East Germany continues to escalate. In 1952, the Soviet Union proposes the reunification of Germany as a free democratic state on the condition that the new Germany would remain neutral and not be allowed to join NATO. West Germany refuses, fearing that the Soviets will not stick to their promises of allowing the new country independence. To what extent the proposal actually comes from the Soviets or is a real East German initiative, and if so, a missed opportunity for genuine reunification is still an issue of debate. After Stalin's death in 1953, the Soviet Union proposes that it too should join NATO to preserve peace in Europe. The US and Britain reject this. I guess um, that um, when Stalin died, he was pretty much just like, like, all right, like he wasn't like a, a a um a Mao or a Lenin where they kind of you know idolize and statues and everything and like you know preserve their corpse perfectly and everything. I guess he was more like hated among the leadership and the greater people, and they kind of like, all right, he's gone. Let's kind of go our own way. Maybe a little consolidation. Seeing it as an attempt to stop the buildup of NATO forces in Europe. Instead, they move to include West Germany in NATO. The Soviet reaction is to form the Warsaw Pact in 1955. This 
effectively joins the Soviet Union and seven Central and Eastern European satellite states into a single cohesive military force. On paper, the two blocs are now in a balance of power state, but only if you don't consider the right nuclear arm consolidation. I was wrong about that right there. Race. The Soviets had already begun developing my point more being that they didn't like Stalin nuclear arms during World War II, but it would take until 1949 for them to develop a functional atom bomb to test. The U.S. is well aware of Soviet efforts, and I'm not saying that you should obviously have nuked Moscow. Obviously not, um, but it, there the idea it was obvious and they must have known in fact i think it it was uh some research researchers on the bomb or some people who worked on the manhattan project that ended up leaking some stuff that made um the russians able to make the bomb i'm not positive on that but i'm pretty sure that's what happened and in that inter interim period obviously you have so much on your plate and everything's like i said it's happening so fast that kind of you know nazis oh they're not the problem anymore um, you know, Hitler's dead. They conquered Japan, or they, yeah, they conquered Japan. And I know uh, it said, I think, 40, 1949 was when the Soviets got it. The U.S. had it in 1945. That's four years of obvious, obviously a lot of stuff going on, like I said. So uh, it's obviously hindsight is 2020, but maybe they should have been more of a threat of using the bomb in between. Um, uh, the 1945 and 1949, maybe to deter the Russians. I don't know. Like I said, hindsight's 2020, but and in response, increases its nuclear program from an estimated 13 warheads in 1947 to 2,422 by 1955. In the same time frame, the Soviets are able to increase their arsenal to 200. The U.S. is clearly ahead. By the time John F. Kennedy is inaugurated as president in 1961, the U.S. has an estimated 22,229 operational warheads, while the Soviets possess just 2,492. We fight the battles no one hears about. We're the ones who go you before all others. There, thank you. Furthermore, the deployment systems of the U.S. are so much more advanced that the Soviets have no realistic chance of launching a first strike that would lead to anything other than immediate self-destruction. JFK knows this. The by now sole leader of the Soviet Union, mm. Nikki chance of launching more advanced that the Soviets have no realistic chance of launching a first strike that would lead to anything other than immediate self-destruction. JFK knows this. The by now sole leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev knows this. The military commanders on both sides know this. The KGB knows this, the CIA knows this, but the American and Soviet public do not know this. And this will prove crucial in the crisis to come. Meanwhile, in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Europe, the dance of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary actions goes on. Four of these hotspots will become critical for Kennedy. Berlin, Vietnam, Laos, and Cuba. Okay. The developments in Southeast Asia in the 1950s lead to the domino theory formulated by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1954. This theory states that if one country in a region is allowed to fall to communism, then the rest will swiftly follow. The Laotian Civil War is a proxy war that neither the Soviets nor the US are really keen on fighting, but still have to stay engaged in. That war breaks out in 1953, but will soon spill into the Vietnam War, which begins two years later which in turn will partly reignite the Korean War. And it looks more and more like the domino theory is correct. So, crazy. so after New Year's 1959, when Fidel Castro rather unexpectedly succeeds with the Cuban Revolution, the U.S. thinks it has all the reason in the world to fear a communist surge in its own backyard and that it needs to be stopped as swiftly as possible. I should point out here that the Western powers under U.S. leadership have more money than the Soviet Union, more resources, and outpower it in nuclear arms by a factor of 10. And yet, both sides are capable of destroying the world. And now, here we stand, as the 1960s are about to begin, with them facing each other ever more warily, over a world ever more divided in two, and that world will very soon be on the brink of nuclear holocaust.
I mentioned Stalin's death, but if you want to see his rise to power, you can click here for our Between Two Wars episode about that. You can also click subscribe to never miss an episode of this whole series, as well as all the other awesome series Time Ghost produces. And if you'd like to help us create more and better content, join the Time Ghost army and support us at Patreon. Great video. I definitely will subscribe. Like it. Awesome channel. I can't wait to get into the rest. I'll make those uh, separate videos. I'll make another or two today. Uh, again, great, very fascinating. I'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, remember to like and subscribe, all right? Right there. And check out these uh, videos here, all right? See you guys. Later.